Our next speaker is uh, Professor Zhilung Feng from uh, the mathematics department at, uh, at Purdue. And Zhilung is a mathematician. And uh, her talk is going to be on applications of epidemiological models to public health policy. First, I'd like to thank uh, our Good <laughs> Thank you uh, for inviting me for uh, the opportunity to uh, speak here. And this is a joint work with uh, John Glasser is at uh, CDC. Uh, so, uh, most uh, uh, work we'll present today is uh, collaborate with him, and there are other collaborators uh, in several parts of the uh, work. Uh, I will present two models today uh, to demonstrate ideas that uh, mathematics can be very helpful and sometimes you can use very simple models and sometimes you need more complex uh, models. Just depend on what kind of problems we want to study and what kind of questions we want to address. <coughs> so the first model, very simple model, is used to uh, predict the epidemic peak, the time when the, uh, the peak will be reached and how uh, uh, given vaccination uh, programs can help reduce the uh, epidemic size. And the model is very simple. It's uh, only a system of three equations uh, and sort of very standard SIR type of a model. The only difference, only complexity here is this transmission rate. Uh, the most standard one has the constant transmission rate, beta. But here we have a periodic function. That is because influenza has this kind of annual uh, uh, pattern of the uh, prevalence. So the periodic function here uh, has uh, three parameters. Beta zero is the baseline constant, and the beta one sort of uh, give the magnitude of the oscillation part. And then the third one is the T0, that's time of initial introduction of the uh, case, uh, the first case. And the, peer, the period here is one year. So uh, the idea is to use early data from uh, summer or spring to estimate those parameters, beta zero, beta one, and T0, and use those parameter values and uh, in the model to predict the full uh, wave. Before you, before you go on, there may be people in here who do not know what S, I, and R stands for. I'm sorry, yes. So S represents susceptible. So those are the uh, individuals who are not infected but capable of uh, contracting the disease. And the I represent infected or uh, infectious. So those are people who are infected and uh, as, uh, are able to transmit the disease. And the R for recovered. So for influenza, permanent immunity is assumed. So once per a person is recovered from uh, the infection, they will uh, uh, not be susceptible again. So that's SIR. Thank you. And the, the uh, gamma is the recovery rate. And the one over gamma, since this ODE ha has an assumption on exponential distribute duration, so one over gamma will represent the mean duration of uh, infection, so the infection period. And this is some constant for influenza, say one over seven, seven days. So it's a constant. So the only thing that's changing would be the um, other parameters. Thank you. Um, so we want to first estimate the primary values. This figure here shows the early wave, uh, the spring wave, and then uh, also summer. This is by week. And there are the different colors. Different colors represent different strings, different types. So we're interested in this H1N1, the orange color. And you see the sudden jump in the orange uh, bar? That's because after the uh, spring wave, there's increased testing of the H1N1. So that's actually just report case increase. It doesn't imply that you know, there's uh, you know, no or, or very uh, small number of H1N1. So when we ask them the parameter values, we have to take that into account to um, to avoid the bias in the reporting system. So we did some statistic analysis and decided that from week 21 and 33, those would be the data that would be good to use to estimate the parameter values. And we use this uh, Pearson chi-square statistics 
by minimizing the difference between the model prediction and the observed, and then you get those values, beta zero, beta one, and P zero, with those mean values and 95% confidence interval. And then we use those values to uh, predict the fall break, fall uh, wave. Given the uh, planned CDC uh, vaccination rollout uh, programs, at that time, this is, uh, uh, do you want to work with the Shear Tower, who's a postdoc at Purdue? So at that time, the vaccine was not ready yet because H1N1 is sort of a new uh, virus, there's uh, no vaccine available. Uh, so the blue area represents the epidemic curve under the given vaccina uh, the, the, uh, <coughs> vaccination program, and the gray area is that's without. So what the model predict here so we have a data after that point, uh, September. So we predict that the, the fall break, the peak will be reached near Halloween, the end of October, early November. And the effect of uh, vaccination uh, the program will uh, have a relative reduction of 6% in the total number of infections. So this, we submitted this paper in October 5th, uh, 8th, and it's published on October 15th. So the prediction is that at the near end of October, the, the peak will be reached. And that kind of big concern is when the peak will be reached right? and because it may uh, you know, get uh, over um, uh, burden of the hospitals or uh, uh, many other concerns, of the availability of vaccines. So the peak time is very important uh, quantity to uh, predict. So that's what we focus on. And so we published this, and, and then a few days later, we got a lot of uh, media uh, attention. And one of them is from Washington Times. So they actually emphasized on the vaccine was too late, because we predict only 6% reduction to the vaccination, h one vaccine too late to help most Americans. And that was the part we got a lot of attention. And even uh, the, the meeting, the Senate meeting on the H1N1 uh, pr uh, preparedness uh, mentioned this, this study. Uh, this, uh, uh, so Peter was asked uh, by uh, Susan uh, Collins, I think, and I said, uh, the Purdue study mentioned that the peak will be reached next week and your vaccine is still not available, so how you uh, uh, make a plan on this? So I know she, she was saying from the past experience, usually the, the second wave will not be reached until the following year, because that's what happened in the most uh, flu uh, uh, epidemics. So he said uh, vaccine will still be uh, useful for uh, you know many Americans, and and that was because she gave uh, explanation really uh, good. And so no matter what happens, uh, still uh, the, her uh, you know can explain um, answers. But after the pandemic is over, so this is a, a CDC data that uh, H1N1, and that's our prediction. You look at the weeks, so actually it matched pretty well uh, in terms of uh, time of the pandemic peak. And also looking at the flu, uh, Google flu trend. Looking, looking at the old past years from 2004, five, six, seven, eight, they most of them, uh, did occur in the following year, in the near February, uh, only 2004, was a little earlier, but still uh, not as early as 2009. The peak was reached near at end of October. So the point of this study is that simple model, simple mathematical models can be very helpful uh, in terms of questions like uh, this, right? When uh, the, the second peak uh, can be reached and how big the peak is, how effective the vaccination program uh, will be. Um, and obviously there are a lot of heterogeneities, uh, a lot of other factors that were not considered in the model. Uh, and there are um, also, uh, you know, for example, different states have different char characteristics and we didn't consider in the model. But even uh, 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 with that, those um, simplifications, the model was still uh, uh, kind of very helpful. And we were actually uh, also contacted by CDC um, Nathaniel uh, Harper. He was trying to give us data, so his idea was like if we have state-by-state state data, 
if we can predict which state, state will have the peak reach peak first, maybe they can better plan a sort of distribution of uh, vaccines. But then after, and at, uh, after at the end of uh, October, the actually the, the, the case, uh, the things are getting uh, much better. It's not as urgent as you know, for, uh, uh, early October. So we, uh, we didn't do that kind of analysis. Okay. So um, this is the first model. The second one is sort of more complex models. That's because the particular question we want to study requires uh, the in, uh, in incorporation of the complexities. Uh, what we want to model is this measles outbreaks. Uh, the, uh, 2008 measles outbreak in uh, San Diego County. And there was a seven-year-old boy who visited uh, Switzerland and then came back with measles and infected several other uh, school students. And the uh, data uh, about this <coughs> outbreak which school, uh, what, what uh, the, the children's background, family income, or race, and all kind of uh, information available for this outbreak. So we are gonna use all those information, most of those information, uh, data uh, information to uh, parameterize our uh, model to study how this vaccine, how, how the, um, this, uh, I forgot to mention that the reason for the, the boy get the, infected because uh, the boy was not uh, vaccinated and there's a large fraction of students in California in uh, many schools the parents do not want their children to get vaccinated because the personal belief exemption so we want to focus on that different schools have different kind of percentage of unvaccinated children due to different reasons particularly the uh, personal belief exemptions and we want to see how uh, this heterogeneity in vaccine coverage may affect the, the population immunity and how we can reduce uh, this are um, uh, not the basic repression number so that we can increase population immunity and prevent measles outbreaks. Okay, so this is uh, San Diego County and, uh, uh, and also uh, the certain school district, the yellow uh, circles represent the uh, the percentage of uh, students that are vaccinated, and also this shows similar uh, data. What, what the, you represent the ones that are not vaccinated. Not vaccinated. No, gotcha. and co uh, the coverage. So twenty percent. So some school has as high as twenty percent not vaccinated children. Uh, so and that, that's sort of distribution there. Okay, and also very recent. Um, have this very recent, uh, just like in October 4th, they actually reported also the every, uh, at least one in 10 powers uh, schools that are not vaccinated. It's also about California. Um, so we want to uh, basically study how this heterogeneity, different schools, you see that the, 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 our focus is that some schools are larger, uh, like in a say middle city has a much uh, so not highly connected with other schools. So if you have an interaction between school uh, students, and some school may have a higher influence uh, because of uh, connectivity. So we want to see how to choose those highly influential schools to uh, increase coverage and others. And um, so the, 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 the measure we use is this are not so in epidemiological models, this quantity is uh, very uh, important in terms of determining population immunity and the design uh, strategies of disease uh, control and prevention. And this P here, so in general, you have this kind of idea, vaccination will reduce this uh, uh, susceptibility of population. So you reduce the reproduction number <coughs> under the uh, control strategy. So you would like to have this appeal high enough so the reproduction number is below one. So one is threshold. If R0 is bigger than one, disease will spread. If R0 is less than one, disease can uh, be uh, controlled. So we want to focus on that uh, specific uh, quantity, reproduction number. Um, <coughs> okay, so this is the model. Again, it's SIR type, susceptible, infected, infectious, and recovered. And the lambda 
I, that's the forcing infection, transmission uh, the, 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 of SOSEPO in the subgroup I represents say school, school I. Uh, and then the school I can have a contact with school J, okay, other schools. And there, if there's a contact that a certain probability, the susceptible person can get infected. So that's the lambda I here. And the recovery rate assumed the same for all uh, students. Uh, <coughs> the, um, the difference between this model and the model I showed earlier, okay, in that model we have periodic uh, forcing uh, uh, transmission. Here we assume a constant beta. And also now instead of single set of population, SIR, we have I, J, um, so you have N population okay, representing schools. And this transmission here, because of connectivity between schools, so this force infection may be more complicated. Uh, but you don't have interaction between schools. They're all the same coefficients. Uh, between schools, th this is between schools, right? This SI. Um, but you have SI, I, S -I, I, I, I in there anyway. Here's IJ. Oh, OK. Right? I so lambda I, SI, there's a I, I, J in there. So, so between susceptible so school I and infected school J. Okay. And the important parameter in this model is the CIJ. That's the contact between school I and between p individual in school I and school J. Okay. And that mixing function is most important that we have to model uh, to estimate that, that, uh, those uh, parameter values. And uh, just to demonstrate the, the, the mathematical approach, uh, consider two populations that the idea can apply to n population. And for this two, uh, uh, so, the, so, for, so this matrix is a, a general one for n populations. You can have each population has reflection number, so uh, V1, so V represent under the vaccination uh, strategy. Uh, one, two, three, those would be the index uh, the schools. And each school has one isolated regression number, and for the entire population, the regression number can be calculated using this matrix. So this matrix connects all the schools, right, with isolated regression number, numbers, and those CIJ connectivity, connection between school I and school J. Okay. So with N school, you cannot, usually it's very difficult to get an explicit formula for the regression number. The dominant eigenvalue of this matrix is the R0. But we, you can uh, calculate this R0 numerically, uh, but we want to show the idea by looking at the two population. When equal to two, you can actually get this explicit formula, and you can see how the formula depends on the Cij, right, the mixing pattern. Um, the, so you see the regression number here, RV, is uh, the basic regression number that is in absence of vaccine, multiplied by 1 minus PI. PI is a fraction of population vaccinated. Okay, so PI is between 0 and 1. If PI is close to 1, then this number is 0, right? So you have very high coverage, and disease will not be able to spread. But if PI is 0, there's no vac uh, vaccine, uh, no vaccination, then R0, if this number is greater than 1, then you have uh, infection will spread. So we want to study how the PI <coughs> will <coughs> help to reduce the regression number considering given contact uh, mixing pattern CIJ. Okay, so uh, to, to construct CIJ, uh, here we consider this MIJ, uh, that's the uh, sort of, you will use that to uh, calculate the CIJ. So it is basically here, Proportion, not proportion, related to the distance between schools, school I and J. So D, I, J, this distance between school I and J. And the B is a scaling constant. Let's just say you want, you want the C, uh, contact pattern to match the data, uh, you use the coverage or you know, school population and all, many other factors. So um, this shows the, the school activity. So in the model, we have parameter representing school activity, larger school, maybe highly active in the middle of city, or you know, uh, the, the activity is different compared with our schools in a rural area or you know, smaller schools and so on. So we get a CIJ from MIJ and a population size. This MI represents total population in school I. Okay. And then we can uh,
compute the regression number. Okay, so this table shows that this R0 ignoring heterogeneity. So if you don't have this difference between schools, you have the entire population, you have a single value for R0. And if you uh, calculate that number, it is for mesos, it's about 10.71. And so you should have a, a MMR, this three, uh, this it shows for three uh, infections. And for different disease, you have this uh, R0. And uh, you can calculate the the p-value, so uh, what coverage, what vaccine coverage will make the reproduction number less than one. Okay. So for those infections, the population immunity, so that's a p, and you, know, you need to have those uh, coverage. Okay. Yes? Is this calculated from your data, or is this uh, literature-based? The, the but this is from data, like uh, from data coverage, or oh, the given coverage. I mean, that's quite a bit lower than Uh, th those are from this, uh, let's see. The, val the value that Anderson and May give, in my, at least in 91, was, was you know, 18 and a half or so. Uh, this is the, uh, those are our 18 under. Right, right, right. Uh, uh, but this, um, so, but this, this is just, this R0 is just given uh, the, the, say, say, uh, infection period. Right, and given the, uh, the um, what is that? And, uh, let me try to think. Uh, yeah, beta, uh, the R now is a beta, beta over gamma, right? Uh, if you have just single population. Um, so maybe it's just that the duration of infectiousness is shorter That might be possible. That's possible, right? Yeah, it's 30 years ago, too, right? So. Uh -huh. Okay. I mean, it's well within the range of what's been estimated in the context yeah. throughout Africa and the Americas. So it's not, it's not, that wouldn't be an unusual. It's on the low side for the unusual. Okay. Thank you. Uh, okay, so, so without heterogeneity, you see this actually pretty close to this uh, threshold. Um, and also you can, uh, considering efficacy of you know, if I need two doses and stuff, so that's all that, what those numbers are. But now if we consider heterogeneity, we consider that the CIJ and uh, connectivity and all other uh, <coughs> factors, then the reproduction number is actually 18.06 and, and also other numbers. So it's much, much higher than this number calculated uh, without heterogeneity. And so for this, Reproduction number, so the problem, uh, the threshold is we uh, under uh, um, required right the immunity in order to control the disease, and now we want to consider how the um, different control strategies can be compared. Right, we consider several uh, methods. The first one is to eliminate all personal belief assumptions. So we shot, uh, sh I showed you earlier the, the distribution of the schools, like some schools have 5% uh, 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 students that are not vaccinated, and some other schools have as high as 20%. But those percentage include all um, uh, reasons for students not get vaccinated. Uh, personal belief exemption is one of those. Okay. So if we just eliminate personal belief exemptions, then we can, um, we need increase the coverage by 2.48. And then uh, the reduction number will be reduced from 3.39 to down to 2.28. And uh, the schools involved to, to do this will be 292 schools and involving that, that many students. And if we consider low coverage, so from the the map, you can see which school has low coverage. So if we focus on those schools, then we can uh, increase, I need to increase coverage by this, in this range, and that will reduce re the re regression number by uh, that value in that range. And the, the, this one again gives the number of schools and number of students involved. 
So there are several uh, ways. Of, this is low coverage <coughs> high activity schools and all high activity schools and all low coverage schools. And if we look at those two, so it shows that those two methods will reduce our uh, V by similar amount, uh, magnitude. And, but the, the number of students involved and number of schools involved are very different. And also this, this table doesn't consider cost. Usually that will be a very important too. All kind of cost right, uh, involved uh, to apply those uh, uh, programs. And it'll be interesting to consider uh, those as well. But now if we just consider how uh, many students involved, how many schools involved, and how much uh, reduction R0 will uh, have, and we can say that those two are very similar. So, so this example shows that um, if we uh, want to study the impact of a heterogeneity, then you do need this uh, model that, you know, at least you have, if you have uh, 600 schools, uh, right, uh, that could be the model huge, many, many equations. Uh, but it does help to answer questions, you know, how we can uh, reduce RV by using different programs. Okay. Without heterogeneity, you won't be able to do that. And also, the regression number, if you don't consider heterogeneity, your regression number is way um, low okay, than uh, what uh, could be. So now, I want to go back to the mixing matrix. Right? That's the key. The, and this study focused on how we can actually get those parameter values, how we can estimate those parameter values, CIJ, in general, not just for this particular problem. Uh, in, uh, this heterogeneity is in school uh, uh, size and uh, distance and the connectivity. But we want to consider also age uh, heterogeneity because if you have a, um, children of different ages, they can usually children tend to have more contact with other children the same age or similar age uh, groups. So the mixing is not random, it's not proportional to, <coughs> to the number of students. So uh, we want to get this age-dependent mixing, the mixing pattern. And there are some studies about uh, age-dependent um, sort of uh, pattern or context. Uh, how many, uh, so you, you, there are studies conduct, so how many minutes you spend each, uh, every day, you know, with different age groups and things like that. So we have uh, uh, those data, and this just show you uh, one of them, Mosong data, it shows that this is age groups, okay, 0 to 4, 10 to 14, and so on. You see the main diagonal, uh, lighter color represents more contact, and the darker color uh, fewer. So the, this main diagonal shows that children in the same age, or not just children, not all, everyone, okay, older and, and, and young. So you have same, so same age people tend to have more contact, right? So you still have a fixed number of contacts a day, you spend most of your contact to, with, with the, people uh, same age or similar age uh, groups. And that's the main diagonal, and that has been studied by um, uh, several other people earlier. But from this study, we also see the off diagonal. So that represents parent and the children contacts. And uh, so that has not been studied. So we want to develop a modeling framework that can be used to actually capture this both main diagonal and off diagonal. Uh, preference. Is that matrix meant to be symmetric? Oh, that's a very good point. This is data. It's, so it's not symmetric because the data, you know, it's not perfect, right? So when you, you tell people age five, or you know, how many, right? What percent of time they with age 20, and you got 20, that's very different. Okay. Yeah. Thank you for mentioning that. But when we construct a mathematical uh, Model, we have to make sure it's symmetric. Yeah. Right? How, how many kind of you know you spread with other people has to be you know uh, match. You also have uh, grandparents and children. Very good. So we did later. Oh. But the, this uh, from this data doesn't show very clearly, right? But the, uh, actually, if you do this statistical analysis, you do see the grandparents and children uh, preference, right? But we want to do the first, do, do, just uh, ex extend the existing. Uh, uh, mixing that consider only diagonal to the one with involved uh, incorporating off diagonal, just the parent children. Um, okay, so this is the um, sort of um, 
conventions at any given mixing function will have to satisfy, including the one you mentioned. So the first of all, CID, all the contacts have been non-negative. And second of all, the, for each given group I, all the contacts, CID is a fraction of contact with the group J. So given group I, your, the total number of contacts sum up over J has to be one, right? Because of a fraction. And third, this is symmetric condition you mentioned. So how many contacts uh, from group I with group J total has to match the total number of contacts from J with I? Okay. So those three basic conditions will have to be satisfied. And one of the uh, typical, uh, most uh, commonly used mixing is the so-called proportional mixing. So it's assume, uh, assume that basically my survival group I, I my con probability that my contacts with group J is proportional to the number of people in group J. Uh, uh, from J to I, the total number of people in group I and activity level of group I. So the bottom, the numerator is the sum of all contacts. Okay, so proportional uh, to the number of contacts in, in the given group. So that obviously will not capture the off-diagonal uh, um, phenomenon. Not even main diagonal uh, phenomenon, because this main diagonal, you need to have a preference. Okay? The proportional mixing doesn't have the preference. To incorporate this uh, main diagonal uh, preference, uh, so this is a study by uh, Jack uh, and, and I, I wanted to point out that I'm L. You're in L? <laughs> oh, you're, okay. <laughs> Uh, uh, so this is a yeah, very nice study, right? They incorporate the main diagonal preference. So what this assumes is that so epsilon is the preference, so fraction of your context that is with your own age group. And so delta ij, that's the standard delta function, so it is one if ij equal and zero otherwise. So that captures the main diagonal, right? And uh, so the epsilon fraction reserved for your own group and one minus epsilon will be with others. So you split the remaining in using this proportional uh, way. Okay. And so you look at the diagram that does capture the main diagonal um, preference. Okay. So now we want to generalize this to incorporate off diagonal. So what we did is to uh, have three epsilons. Okay. Epsilon one is the main diagonal with your own age group. Epsilon two is with the parents. Epsilon three is a parent with the children. So you have a three uh, epsilon and with uh, appropriate scaling. Okay. And the remaining uh, context will be proportional to anyone else. Okay. So with this and, and fitting those uh, model to the Monson data, we can estimate those epsilon, three epsilon values with a certain given, so the bars represent the confidence intervals. And so now you see the symmetric, right, the function. So you, uh, with the fitted data, and you can see this is the observed data and this is the model fitting. So you can capture this uh, off diagonal uh, preference. But uh, another thing is, that this is just a, uh, so I didn't have slides. So this assumption is, so delta ij is your preference <coughs> with other children of exactly the same age. And, and Herb Hathcote uh, also studied, uh, this generalized idea, instead of using delta function, you use the Gaussian kernel. So basically your preference is not just with a single group, but the nearby ages. So we, we also did that, so assuming, re, uh, relaxing the delta function to be Gaussian kernel. Okay. Uh, so this one is just, uh, uh, it's gonna appear uh, in uh, Math Bio Science 2001, and so again, John Glasser is the leading uh, author. Um, so so uh, mm, next one, so we want to see, uh, now we have the mixing function C. How much time do I have? Oh, okay. 15 minutes. 15 minutes, okay, thank you. So we have the CIJ, so we want to put this back in the model, we want to study the vaccination uh, strategy, right? How you can reduce regression number by applying different uh, uh, policies. But first we want to see how this preference, the epsilon values, may affect the effectiveness of the PI. The PI will be the vaccination coverage in population I. Okay. So to demonstrate the idea, we still con again consider the case of n equal to two, two populations. Okay. 
um, you have epsilon one, epsilon two. So uh, make an additional simplification uh, assumption. Say epsilon one, epsilon two are the same. So the two H groups have uh, exactly the same preference. And just to see how this preference may affect uh, the vaccination, uh, the effectiveness of uh, the P's. Um, so uh, let me show you the next one. This is a more mathematical. You have to anal analyze how those things are related. But the, the biological uh, interpretation, so once you have this uh, mathematical work uh, figured out, and you can uh, try to study how uh, those mathematical results uh, uh, translate to biological uh, interpretation. So what this shows that uh, we have this reflection number RV, and RV is a function of a preference epsilon and the vaccination coverage to P. Okay, epsilon one, epsilon two, P one, P two. So now we have only one epsilon value because epsilon one and epsilon two are equal. But you have P one, P two, the coverage uh, in the two populations. And you set this RV equal to one, give the one differential value. Okay, RV below one, you, you will uh, prevent the, uh, the outbreak. And if RV is greater than one, you have this spread of the infection. So RV is equal to one, that's the threshold uh, value. And so the, the dielectric different uh, style, different curves, correspond to different epsilon values. So epsilon is a preference between zero and one. When epsilon <coughs> is approaching one, and we, this R equal to one actually um, tends to this <coughs> two lines. And within this region, RV is less than one. So that means that for all those P1 and P2 values in that region, RV will be less than one. So your coverage in population one and population two can be any combination in there. Okay, RV will be less than one. When epsilon is reduced to zero, uh, you get this line. So that means that in that range, in that region, no matter what P1, P2 combination you have, you will not get RV less than one. RV is always greater than one. So you won't be able to control uh, the infection. For any other epsilon values, and you see this curve, it's increasing. Right? So uh, above those curves, RV less than one. Below that curve, epsilon is greater than one. So you can design, choose your P1, P2 value so that they are uh, in a region above the curve. So you can have RV less than one. Okay. So, so this tells you that the preference does matter, right? The preference, epsilon value, the preference between uh, different age groups can affect the effectiveness of vaccination coverage. Okay. Um, so that's um, this example considering age preference. And the, the early example I showed you for the San Diego uh, measles outbreak, that's location, right, coverage between schools, distance between schools. Now, if we consider another mixing that incorporates both, both age and distance, and that's exactly what, you know, if you consider the San Diego school district, it has the age preference within each school, and it also has preference between schools. Like a nearby school may have a higher preference and a far away probably uh, less. So we want to develop um, another mixing function that can combine age and spatial heterogeneity. Uh, heterogeneity. Okay. And that doesn't have to be just age and spatial, it can be any other demand, any other uh, kind of heterogeneity. Okay. But the framework will be the same, mathematical framework will be the same. So consider uh, two, uh, not two indices, okay. M for <coughs> location, so you have N location and N age groups, and L for location, L I is location I, and A P is H group P, and the, the big A L I A P that's activity level of population and location L and H group A P, okay. and the N that's for the population size at that location I, H group P, okay. and uh, so this uh, expression for the contact mixing, instead of two indices, earlier I have IJ, but now you have four indices. You have LI, LJ, the location I and J, you have HP and HQ, two groups. 
and but the general structure is similar. Basically, so you have a two levels of preferences. Okay, assume they are like independent, separate, separable. So you have, uh, first of all, you have a location preference. So the subscribe L for location preference, and the remaining location will be spread among other locations. And within each location, you have an age preference, A for age. And that has also, uh, so this is considered only one uh, preference, the main diagonal pre uh, preference, um, because we're considering the school population, right? And so this is uh, sort of like a CIJ, and then you have the whole thing here. And graphically, so this is, and you can write down all the uh, expressions for the F, G, and H so, uh, properly, you know, taking into account how the mixing, how the number of contacts is, uh, uh, is divided or distributed. But from the graph, we can see probably uh, better. So suppose you have two locations. And with location Li, so you want to see how an individual in that location will distribute the contacts uh, among uh, different age groups and a different location. So this is the preference, location preference. And within location, you have the age preference. And the remaining part, one minus epsilon, L will be spread among also this is one other location, you have many other locations okay, among those. And then you can put them together to get that kind of um, two level mixing with, with uh, uh, preferences. Okay. And then you can study model like this. Okay. So now you have a, a subscript for location and for age, and you can write down this uh, sort of SIR model again with a similar structure, and the P for uh, vaccine coverage, and the lambda, that's the transmission. So you have a transmission, okay. so transmission between uh, locations and between age groups, okay. Is, uh, so you have a, we have data that we can estimate the CIG, like we did for the, the San Diego uh, population. And then you can uh, use this model to study how the different preferences, right, so CIJ is, is the one here, right? CIJ is here. So you got all the absolute preferences. You can see how those preferences will affect the, the, the effect of uh, vaccine coverage. Right? Um, okay, I think that's that here. Okay, for the support. Thank you. about your first model, the uh -huh. simple one. Uh -huh. uh, so in, in that part, you showed how effective it is in predicting uh, sort of the, the peak of uh, H1N1. Right. And then you move to more complex models for more complex right. uh, phenomena. Mm -hmm. But in that first model, you got a lot of press. Some of it looked pretty scary. Now my question is, because influenza is, you know, a sort of a transmission is age, age related. There's, why not? In, in, and in fact, you have to do computer simulations to solve it anyway. Mm -hmm. Why not use a more complex model to get finely tuned information? In that first yeah, time? because of time, right? Mm -hmm. It was like a really short time. Ah. <laughs> so we, 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 but it would seem natural. It will definitely, so, you know, definitely, then, definitely. Because the, the everyone was talking about you know when will the second peak will be reached right and then and how 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 large it will be, and that was already end of September, so we, we actually submitted October eighth, so that's like a couple of weeks uh, thing you had you had used the the spring and, uh, and summer data right you had you had to constantly update your data because well, as more data available and then you're gonna uh, adjust those things, and then at the time it's like we you know we we think we we're, we can submit it, so so we didn't go. Uh, with a more complex, uh, yeah. but it would have been right. You would have would, finer tune as you had the time. You would, you would have, have to, finer right. tune. Definitely, definitely. I, I'm sure we'll get it probably um, better. I, I'm not. I, no, I'm not. Sometimes more complex can be better, but it also can be misleading. That you, you have a lot of parameters you you estimated, and you probably will not be able to capture what is the key, uh, which one more, right? Play the main role. Uh, so each complex or simple model, they both have advantages and disadvantages. Um, and then it's just, um, yeah. thank you. Mm 
very much.